Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by in your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. amen. Our first reading is short, and it comes from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village, where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is a need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Here ends the first reading. Uh, before I read verses from chapters 9 and 10 from 1 Corinthians, a brief word of introduction. Uh, the, many of you know the Apostle Paul never saw Jesus while Jesus was on earth. Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, and that began Paul's, uh, well, Saul became Paul and a missionary. Uh, Paul and a few others traveled far and wide, proclaiming the gospel not only to Jews, but also to Gentiles. In a letter to the church at Corinth, which Paul had founded, so it was very special in his heart, Paul was trying to address many controversies that were swirling. Can you imagine controversies in the church? Uh, anyway, he was trying to address some of these in a, the first letter to the church in Corinth. And uh, Paul was being accused of not really being a good apostle for many reasons. And the people in the church were particularly concerned about the practice of eating food that had been offered to idols. Because again, some of these people were Jewish in their origin and concerned about purity laws, others were not. And so there was a lot of controversy about, ooh, what do we do? Should we shun someone who eats uh, food that's been offered to idols? So his writing style, as you may know, if you've read any of his epistles, is very convoluted. He was writing in a style that we no longer really relate to. He writes more run-on sentences than even I do, and that's saying a lot. So uh, stay with me, but he's talking about freedom and grace and living among people and sharing the good news with people from different cultures and who have different expectations. So when you hear people under the law, those are likely to be Gentiles who are also trying to follow Jewish law. And then you'll hear people outside the law. Those are probably regular Gentiles who are not trying to follow the Jewish law. But hopefully the, the main points will come through amidst his run-on sentences. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, selected verses, and 10 selected verses. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Then he talks at length about different aspects of being an apostle and freedom. And he continues, for if I do this work, this proclaiming the gospel of my own will, I, will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation, I make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, 
I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. And continuing with chapter 10, verse 23, all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Do not seek your own advantage, but that of the other. And continuing with verse 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, so that they may be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. We don't have any of our younger members except the very, very young, and I've asked our youth to come forward for the time with all ages and thank you for in advance for being good sports and doing that. So have any of you ever played the sort of imagination game and I'm guessing you older ones have where you think about what animal would you want to be if you could be any animal for one day what would it be? I see some heads nodding. Are any of you willing to share that? I won't put the microphone. You can just speak up. Uh, what is, what, a bird? What kind of bird? Any kind? So you can fly? Okay. Anyone? An otter. Well, there we go. A simpatico. Nino, what about you? Do you have an animal you would like to be for a day? No? <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. Any particular kind of dog? Living live in life live in life uh, it's fine i also would like to be an otter so um and get you've said a little bit about why it was so you could fly and uh, what about otters lay in the water all day there are worse ways to spend your time and uh, stephen did you say because you just live life people feed you you go for walks yeah enjoy it yeah good Animals have different skills. They're different from one another, and they have different cool things about them. They have different things that are maybe not so great about them. And even the same kind of animal can be different from another one of those same kind of animals. I've had a number of cats. I'm a cat person. And over my lifetime, since I was a child, I've had uh, I won't say owned, because no one owns a cat, but uh, I've had uh, in my household a number of cats, and they've been each the same in some ways, but they've also been pretty different from each other. If you've had a pet, maybe you feel the same, like a dog, one dog is, loves to do this, and another dog wants to stay home and sit by the fire. So even within the same kind of animal, people, the animals are different. And I have loved all my cats, whether they're aloof or lap kitties, I've loved them all because they're different from each other and I like it that way. The reading that Evie read so beautifully this morning is about two sisters, Martha and Mary. Mary chose to sit and listen to Jesus. He was just visiting. He didn't live near them. He was visiting and she chose to sit and listen to what he had to say. Martha chose to fix dinner and get all kinds of things ready in the house. Very different choices for two different sisters. When Martha complained about her sister, Jesus answered that Mary had made the good choice to listen. It was Martha's choice to fix dinner and miss what Jesus had to say. 
And it's kind of nice to know that in the Bible, even brothers and sisters in the same family can be different from one another. And even if you're an only child, if you've got cousins, they might be different than you. And it's nice, it's good that way. It's, we're not all supposed to be the same person. We have different likes and dislikes. Uh, and it's not just families. Our friends, we can be good friends with someone that really maybe we share some things, but maybe they're very different than us, and that's a good thing too. I think God loves the things that make us different from one another. Uh, I hope you will be able to listen to the sermon um, when I talk a little bit about how otters and beavers and magpies, I'll have a picture of a magpie, show us a little bit about God and the way God loves us. Just like people, those animals are different from one another, from each other, and that's okay. So let's pray. Thank you, God, for making each of us as us, each of us one of a kind, yet all part of your loving family. Help us to celebrate each other and help us to learn how to get along with one another so that we can show people your love. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Maybe the sound of my voice isn't as soothing this morning as it sometimes is. Uh, on this gentle and turns out sunny morning, I'm starting a summer preaching series entitled The Gospel According To. For about six Sundays, then hopping forward to Labor Day, uh, Labor Day weekend, we will hear good news from the Bible, of course, but also from some unexpected sources. We will depart from the lectionary, but we will stay with the scripture as our guide. Today we hear from a few animal friends. In the coming weeks, we will hear the gospel according to a couple Persian poets from that new Disney Pixar movie sequel, Inside Out 2, from the Beatles, and a couple other surprising sources. So let's hear from otters, beavers, and magpies. As I said, I have always loved, I think I've always loved otters. River otters and sea otters, it doesn't really matter which. I don't like to think of them as members of the weasel family, but they are. <laughs> National Geographic has a nice little uh, description, overview of otters. River otters hunt at night and feed on whatever might be available. Fish are a favorite food, but they also eat amphibians, turtles, and crayfish. On land, river otters can bound and run quite well, if not quite as effectively as they swim. They love to playfully slide down snow-covered, icy, or muddy hills, often landing with a splash in the water. Otter families of mother and children can be seen enjoying such fun, which also teaches survival skills, end quote. For many of us, it's video or photos of uh, otters playing on a hillside or sea otters bobbing on the waves with, a, with their baby or a clam in their tummy uh, that have endeared them to uh, many of us human types. They are playful, but they're also good at getting the food that they need. And of course, beavers have a different reputation. They are industrious and they're second only to humans in their ability to adapt their environment, not to adapt to their environment, but to adapt their environment. Here's what National Geographic has to say about beavers. Beavers are famously busy and they turn their talents to re-engineering landscape as few other animals can. When sites are available, beavers burrow in the banks of rivers and lakes, but they also transform less 
suitable habitats by building dams. Felling and gnawing trees with their strong teeth and powerful jaws, they create massive log, branch, and mud structures to block streams and turn fields and forests into the large ponds that beavers love. Dome-like beaver homes called lodges are also constructed of branches and mud. They are often strategically located in the middle of ponds and can only be reached by underwater entrances. These dwellings are home to extended families of monogamous parents, young kits, and the yearlings born the previous spring. Beavers are among the largest of rodents. They are herbivores and prefer to eat leaves, bark, twigs, roots, and aquatic plants." End quote. You may not be able to see them very clearly, but these two plushies live on my desk at the church office. I keep them there to remind me to find time to play and have fun even as I also work hard. Now, I do not have a plush magpie. Those were a lot harder to find. I'm sure they exist, but I do have this picture, a photo of one. They are related to crows, and we do see crows here in Virginia a lot. And if you imagine a crow, a kind of a smallish crow with the white belly and uh, there's just a hint of blue iridescence in the magpie. When I lived in Australia as a child, and I'll tell you about that some other time, uh, they, magpies were everywhere. They were a nuisance, but they were everywhere. Also, when I lived in Colorado, the little pranksters are very present, even in the suburbs and even in the city. One bird watching website describes their habitat and diet this way. Black-billed magpies live among the meadows, grasslands, and sagebrush plains of the West. Magpies don't avoid human development, often spending time near barnyards, livestock areas, and grain elevators where they have ready access to food. Like other members of the jay and crow family, black-billed magpies have a wide-ranging diet. They eat wild fruit and grain, as well as grasshoppers and beetles that they find while foraging on the ground. They also kill small mammals, such as squirrels and voles, and raid birds' nests. Carrion is also a main food source. That's carrion or dead animals. Uh, as well as the fly maggots found in carrion. Sometimes they steal meat from the kills of coyotes or foxes. Magpies also land atop large animals, such as cows or moose, and pick ticks off of them. When they find an abundant food source, magpies will cache food for short periods." End quote. Because, like their crow cousins, they can be mischievous, some people do not like magpies much. But the North American black-billed magpies are appealing to me with their striking black and white feathers and their clever antics. So you may be asking yourself, what on earth can these three creatures share about gospel truth? Think about Luke's very short story of Jesus' visit with Mary and Martha and see if they bear any resemblance to our animal friends. Franciscan priest and theologian Richard Rohr writes a beautiful little description of what is going on with Martha in his book, The Naked Now, Learning to See as the Mystics See. 
Let's listen to what he says. Martha was everything good and right, but one thing she was not. She was not present. Most likely not present to herself, her own feelings of resentment, her need to be needed. This is the kind of goodness that does no good. If she was not present to herself, Martha could not be present to her guests in any healing way, and spiritually speaking, she could not even be present to God. Presence is of one piece. How you are present to anything is how you can be present to God, loved ones, strangers, those who are suffering. Jesus taught Martha at the mundane, ordinary level because that would reflect her same pattern at the divine level. For Martha and for us, such presence was indeed the one thing necessary. So much of religion involves teaching people this and that, an accumulation of facts and imperatives that is somehow supposed to add up to salvation. The great teachers know that one major change is needed. How we do the moment. Then all the this and that's will fall into line. This is so important that Jesus was willing to challenge and upset his hostess and make use of a teachable moment in the very moment. End quote. Martha was good at being good, but not at being present. The one thing that is needed. All I can say is I said, ouch, when I read that. That insight hits a bit close to home for me. I don't know about you. In other places, Richard Rohr highlights that Martha sometimes is critiqued too harshly. She was on a journey doing the best she could in the way that she could. Like each of us, she had strengths and weaknesses, her gifts and her foibles. So when I think about otters and beavers and magpies, in some small way, those river otters teaching their cubs by playfully sliding down into the water are a little bit like Mary finding the one thing that is needed. Martha seems very much like a busy beaver working hard. She was too preoccupied and resentful to sit and listen to Jesus. Now, anthropomorphizing animals isn't quite fair because we humans seem to have layer after layer of emotions, self-deception, gratitude, anger, and a hundred other emotions. But the metaphor is still, I think, enlightening. Martha was not Perfect. And even though Jesus praises Mary in Luke's story, we can count on the fact that Martha's sister Mary was not perfect either. Paul, the Apostle Paul, achieved great things for the gospel. But elsewhere in his writings, he speaks of a thorn in his side that plagued him his whole life. And he wrote, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. We turn from being all things to all people to choosing one thing that is needed. When we reflect on Mary's choice of the one thing that was needed to be present to herself and therefore to God, we know that whatever our inclination, our personality type, our gifts, and our foibles, God invites us to choose the one thing that is needed, presence. Are you like an otter, a beaver, a magpie, a worker bee, 
a butterfly, a hummingbird, or a hawk? Are you like Martha, Mary, Paul, Thomas, Pontius Pilate? Each of us is a unique child of God. Each of us is on a journey with God, whether we know it or not. We are part of a larger cosmic journey, yes, but we also have a journey that is wholly our own, distinctly and uniquely ours. Sometimes life and the church seem to say that the one thing that is important is to work hard. Hard work is good, but it is not the whole picture, nor is it even the most important thing. The busy beaver can learn a thing or two from that playful otter. Richard Rohr highlights one more thing about being busy, hardworking, resentful Martha. Martha's running distraction and clumsy, futile attempts at love are the beginning of her transformation. It's the same for all of us. From Martha and Mary, from Paul, otters, beavers, and magpies, we learn that we do not come to God by just working harder, staying busier, accumulating more this and that knowledge. God is here in this moment, right now, with the whole world and with each one of us. If we slow down and become present to the presence. Thanks be to God.